everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the seventh in uh, Professor Leon Chua's series of lectures on memristors and memristor-related topics. Today, we're going to learn 10 things that we didn't know about the retina, which should just about double the number of things that I know about it. Mm -hmm. Professor Chua. Thank you. Uh, good morning. So let me just quickly review. A C I define what a CNN is. It's just uh, any collection of cells uh, over any surface uh, or, or object or, or this thing. This could be, for example, uh, a part of our brain you know, of arbitrary uh, uh, geometry. But you have cells. And the cells are typically identical. And, they, they, and they're interacting. Uh, to the, its neighbors. In a cell, in the brain, this would be a, a, the, the synapses. And uh, the important thing to realize is that this, to make CNN interesting is that the cells are very simple. If you pick one cell or one neuron, it doesn't do anything interesting. It's when you put them together that wonderful things happen. And, and, but in the brain, you know, we need typically like 20,000 synapses to get things happen. The amazing thing about CNN is you need only nine neighbors, or in, in some cases, the next layer of that at 25, and that would be all you need to make wonderful things. And you're still going to see more of this today. Uh, uh, let's re have a quick review. Last time, I told you that the famous uh, book by Minsky on Perceptron, uh, which uh, uh, in, in the 60s had received uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of funding, until uh, Minsky came out with this book and showed that that, op that uh, machine called Perceptron is actually not very powerful in the sense that they cannot, uh, the, uh, the Perceptron cannot even distinguish two simple geometry shapes, that whether they're disconnected or one piece. And then I showed you the CNN with one template, which is right there, will do the job. And I show you the example then, but today I'm going to have a video to show you the real thing in action. Uh, th this would be, uh, something that you would now see out of this uh, Toshiba, uh, the sensor that is not available in the market. And but this is a video that was uh, done recently, and uh, the videos is uh, made by Professor Tesla from the Technical University of uh, Dresden. And uh, so, can I have video one and two, please? I mean, one and two together. It's in Germany, it's Professor Dres uh, Tesla, Ronald Tesla group in Dresden. And you see that the, uh, below it, you will see the template there. I did, these are the templates, okay, for the first picture, the first image. And the second one that follow will be the same thing. See, now it's, 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 it's just like the way propagated, it's just burning, fire burning the wood. What's, so something's left, so clearly it's not one piece. The next one, uh, that will follow me is the same, exactly the same template. That's important thing is the same template, okay? And, and, uh, and uh, you can see the number is uh, identical. And notice that, that there are negative numbers uh, around the positive one that's important today. Uh, th those are the inhibiting synapses. Now same pattern except now it, and the second pattern. Now you see the end is, is finished, okay? And so, so this is the, the real thing in motion that I've shown you last time, last week, uh, in, in, in a static picture. The next one I show, will show you the bullet uh, hitting a, a, an apple. Uh, there's no technology that I, I believe even today that can capture a bullet in motion. And I've shown you the sna snapshot of those last time. But I want to show you now a very short video that does the same, exactly the same thing, but the video I, it's a little blur, okay? But at least you see in action. So you know that it's not a simulation, it's a real thing. Can I have video three? I'm gonna spread this three times so you can see the, what's, what's the bullet coming from the left and hitting it. And, and so this is already using it at the CNN that was uh, 15 years ago, you know. The, by the way, the Toshiba uh, machine, I mean a uh, chip, it's, a, it's, it's just a fancy dress-up version, basically the same design. 
So, so it, uh, the, the technology is the same. OK, so let me move on now. Uh, by the way, this, this, there is a picture here that I'm going to share a video later from the same group, Dresden. In fact, they got a prize for this uh, application uh, uh, using laser for welding. But I'm, uh, I just want to show you that, uh, that this is a picture of the people who got a prize uh, in Germany. And, but I want to move on now. So, so uh, the perceptron example is just one template. But for more interesting example, application, more demanding one, you may need two or more uh, different templates, and you would program it. And that's what's called a universal machine. And, and uh, there's a special uh, uh, operating operate system and language created for that uh, with the Toshiba uh, machine, for example. I mean, uh, for a smart sensor. Uh, this is all available. And you just write a program. And so, the, so the, you just plug, to write program, you just plug it into a PC, and you, you type in a program, and then you will do things. And I'll show you some of you that today. So for example, here's an image of this lady that I've seen many times. And uh, they, they, they're imagine that, that there is a, a scratch in the face. And the goal here is to restore that scratch to so get the one in the bottom. And the CNN program has been written uh, with, with, with a flow chart. So this one, two, three, et cetera. I'm not going to go to a detail. Uh, the, there's a reference right there you can read up. And, uh, and the algorithm given up the point that you need four templates that are inter indicated there. You can see there are some negative numbers. So you always see that it's interesting that you need inhibition. Okay? So now this is an example of in, in snapshots in motion. And you can see the scratches. In the, this is just a part of the near the eye so you can see the scratch blown up. And you can see that it keep uh, diminishing until in the end it's finished. So that the bottom, you can see the original is identical as the restored image. And I show only a part of that so you can see that. Okay? So now the interesting thing here is that, that we do this by writing a series of program. And the, we do this because uh, it's the same chip, but, it, but we explore the, the fact that the chip is so fast, we're talking about nanoseconds range. So you can afford to make many templates. But in the human, uh, we, we, we don't work that way. We have many different, each of these states is a different CNN. But we have tons of them, so we can afford, we don't need, in, in, the, in the chip thing, we have time multiplexing. In the human brain, it's space multiplexing. Actually, it's doing the same thing. But we, we have tons of uh, cell near neurons, but, but very slow. Whereas in the university, we are so fast, so we time multiplex. So it's actually doing the same thing. Here's an interesting picture of an experiment I'll show you. Uh, of course, this is a lady in a lady's sal salon uh, wearing this usual helmet. Uh, but let's replace the helmet with a special machine, uh, a technology, I mean, a helmet called a whole head neuron magnetometer that was designed using a uh, very high tech principle, including liquid helium. And uh, these are Josephson sen sensors called squid. The, the, it's not important going into detail, except that this lady now is going to be wearing that thing. And so that the, the goal is that this, because of this uh, technology, every part, a little part, few square centimeters of the brain, can sense if there's a signal going through and this is the waveform, for example, of this example. Okay, so this is the, the real picture of that machine, uh, a neural magnetometer. So the goal here is this lady is being shown uh, a cat. And the cat is gonna show at t equals time t equals zero. The head on top will, will flash up, I mean, it will show you when he, you know, it takes about 200, 200 milliseconds. See, when you see the signal go to the, from, the, uh, from the eye, the retina to the back, and that takes about 200 milliseconds, takes time. Then from A, it, it propagates at another 200 milliseconds. By the way, in, in the first one, you can see that the waveform is shown there. At, at, at T equals zero, this, it, it sends the cat, 200 milliseconds. The line there is, is about 830 milliseconds. That's, and later when finally he said cat. The lady is supposed to name what he saw, okay? So, the, so the, this object of this demo is to show you that it takes time to, uh, for, 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 for you to, be, to, to recognize something, say something, uh, and, and this is the, the actual demo uh, published in Nature, by the way. So at T equal 20 milliseconds, at, at that point in the back, uh, in this, the, the, of, of the brain, uh, uh, the, the cat is first, you know, I mean, it's first seen by the, uh, the cat was 
plus a t equals zero. So that, that was the waveform. And then to about 200 seconds, uh, uh, between 200 and 400 milliseconds later, B and C flush up, and those are the two waveforms you see there, OK? And then another, uh, about uh, 500, 800 milliseconds, you see now D, E, F flush up with the corresponding images there, OK? And, and finally, at 800, around 800 uh, milliseconds, it's after eight, yeah, you see G. I mean, uh, G is where the language portion brain is rich, and finally, the guy will say uh, cat. I, I'll show you now. So at 830 millisecond, the, 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 the lady say cat. That's the amount of time it takes for you or anybody else uh, if you go through this experiment. So this is a real thing, OK? And uh, so the important image message here is that it does take time for our brain to uh, go. It's just like going through a, a, a flow chart except that it's a, of, uh, of a command using this universal chip. It goes through different CNNs, OK? Now, there's an interesting true story uh, here that you'll be, uh, you'll probably enjoy. All of you know Niels Bohr. He's a great physicist, but probably few of you didn't know that he was also a great fan of the Wild West and Hollywood. And uh, in particular, he was a great fan of, of drawing, you know, the duel, duel. And the, the, the important, so, so the important thing here is that in the Western movies, uh, the, 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 the winner is looking at the left side. You know, why is it that the good guys always uh, won shootouts in Hollywood movies? You, those of you who have seen uh, things like High Noon or Godfight, OK Corral, or Fish for a Dollar, you all seen that, that the, the bad guy draw first, but he, you know, he's the one that gets shot, OK? Well, uh, Niels has a theory, by the way. His theory is that. Um, and that the bad guy always drew first, as you recall your notice the movie, okay? Uh, but that left the good guy to react unthinkingly and therefore actually faster. And to, to prove his theory, Niels Bohr actually had set up a real experiment in his laboratory, an institute, the Niels Bohr Institute. Now, in, in, imagine the guy in the back is Niels Bohr, okay? And, and then the other guy in the back is one of his sidekicks, okay? And, and he repeated his experiment many times, and he's always right. That he, that he's using toy pistol. They would, toy pistol in the 20s already, and, and he was always right, OK? And so at least in principle, he was correct. And by the way, just for interesting thing, the side, one of the sidekicks is George Gamow. Who, who, who knows George Gamow? Well, great. Because, you know, he's my favorite. That's where I first learned about infinity when I was a kid. Well, that's George Gamow. Among other things, he was, he was uh, uh, noted for this, cent this uh, joke here. You know, we're talking about infinity. We talked about infinity three years ago, so I thought it's good to say this. Uh, George Gamow likes to say that there was a young fellow from Trinity College uh, who took the square root of infinity, but a number of digits gave him the fidgets. He dropped math and took up divinity. That was sort of a, a, one of his famous uh, uh, jokes. OK, and anyway, this is just an aside to, make, uh, 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 to connect this thing to you. So the point here is that the brain is not a, uh, a merged mass of billions of uh, cells. It is, in fact, a community, a vast community of discrete separate CNNs. And by exploiting the phenomena, computing power of the CNN universal chip, it is possible to simultaneously sense many different physical modalities, pressure, such as pressure, temperature, spectra, toxic content, etc., and process this information in real time via the smart CNN fusion algorithm, and now using the Toshiba smart sensor. I want to uh, emphasize that is now in the market. You know, Someone actually asked me the question after the lecture, and they didn't realize that that's now in the market. Okay? Now, so let's now go to the form part of this talk. How many of you have seen this object before? Know what this is? A few of you. Wait. OK, this is uh, uh, called Limulus, uh, the scientific name, or otherwise called the horseshoe crab. Now, this is interesting. This is, in fact, the main issue for the first part of my lecture is going about the Limulus. And this is a, a, the, the, a real community of them in the, somewhere in the Delaware River, uh, I mean, beach. Uh, now, now, the interesting thing about the, the Limulus is that it has two compound eyes on the larger side. But this eye is not like our eye. It has, it's actually made of, you know, 1,220, uh, 1,200 sort of individual eyes. And I will show you later on. But by the way, the, the taxonomic classification of horseshoe crab is actually wrong. You may think that it looks like a crab, but it's not a crab. Uh, the horseshoe crab is not a crab. It belongs to the spider family in view of similarities in their DNAs. And uh, down the, here is the main story now. Haldane, uh, Hardline got his Nobel Prize because of this wonderful experiment. 
that led to this important principle. This, that's the main issue for today's lecture here. Uh, so this is a horseshoe crab with the two lateral eyes, but each one of them is shown in the back. You see, it's got many, many individual eyes, and they're interacting with only this nearest neighbor. It's a perfect example of a CNN. It's about 1,200. So the, so the horseshoe crab has two lateral eyes, each consisting of about 1,200 separate photoreceptor units. They are called Omatildia, this is a scientific name, and which is a couple to the neighboring unit. So, so, so if you can think of this as a, com, uh, as a 35 by 35 CNN, because that will give you about 1,225. So, so, so we have, as you can say that the nature of CNN, in fact, is the compound eyes of the limulus. And I, I picked the limulus because it is the oldest uh, crop, horseshoe crop available from, from fossil record. That we know that. These are direct descendants of tribolites who lived in the, the era where uh, the, the first appearance of land plants and primitive fishes and in, invertebrates. That was, a, you can see this, the great resemblance of this from the uh, limulus. And in fact, limulus is something that didn't evolve at all. Okay, so it's, a, it's, it's so that's, and that's more than 500 million years old. So that's why it's a good example. It's, it's the first nature's uh, CNN. Okay. Now, this here is a classic experiment that led to the Nobel Prize. So, because he, um, Hartline picked the limit because he has a big retina and he can easily uh, attach an electrode to look at the response. So, he shone the light at one of them and he, as he expects, he started seeing this, hear this machine like click, 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 as you see there, okay? And so, he next, did the next obvious thing to do shine more light, and you would expect to be more, right? So you put another beam into the next neighbor and expect you hear blah, 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 even more uh, click, click, click. What a big surprise. He saw less, okay? And that, it was shocking because nobody uh, would expect that. And, but he was very clever enough, immediately realized, just like Hubert and we said that when the, when the crack is the one who did that, they realized something is there. So, so for retina neurons, more is actually less, okay? And uh, so, so in, that, in other words, they, what they found that is, is what Hartford uh, Hartline found is that the 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 uh, each of this uh, uh, material uh, the neuron, uh, I mean the sensor there, actually has a has a big positive template uh, and uh, synapses, and then on the neighbors they are negative, they are inhibiting uh, on on that side, and that was the the the, in the, in, uh, the if you look at the template. That's the, what it is. Okay. You have all negative, all inhibiting with a big response in the middle. Okay. Now, uh, so, so this is exactly how our brain uh, uh, works as well in, in many cases. This, now, this is called a Laplacian template because if, if you just uh, uh, you do, carry out the, the formula that I did in the, the definition CNN, add them all up, you will see that basically that this template it ex executes the equivalent of the Laplacian. Uh, the, if, you, if you discretize the Laplacian, and this was the one I presented early on, the first lecture I showed you that the Turing, uh, Turing has this uh, experiment and, and, and this morphology and, and uh, where, it has the, it, where the reaction diffusion equation, the second part is called Laplacian, and, and that is this term here, okay, that we're looking at. Now, it's interesting if you look at the three-dimensional thing because our brain is, is now has other inhibiting neurons around it. And uh, this is the, the 3D picture that you see here. By the way, how many of you habla espanol or, or speak Spanish? Well, habla espanol means that in Spanish, that's called the sombrero. That's why the title, okay? The sombrero is the Laplacian. Uh, you know, this, uh, how many of you know Pancho Villa? Well, Pancho Villa is the first Mexican that I, you know, that wear this kind of hair. Now it's the mariachi. So, so that is the Laplacian template. So that's easy to remember. And if you, I told you, you can just write out the CN formula and you see that it is exactly resistors. The Laplacian is exactly equivalent to eight resistors around it. So it's dissipated. That's important because when we come back toward the end, we're going to show you that this Laplacian is supposed to just create trouble. I mean, just make things dumb things out. And yet we, we have we find great things happening. And that's because the other part is locally active. Okay. Now, let me move on. So, so we're talking really uh, things that the Chinese knew uh, thousands of years ago. We call the yin yang principle. You know, where if you want anything interesting, complexity requires synergism 
of excitatory and inhibitory dynamics. And this is called lateral inhibition. Now, let's go back to this experiment. If you have only, what you see on top are the two sensors, this is called pointed because it looks like a cone. By the way, this is, our retina has two kinds of sensors. One is very sensitive, what are called cones, looks like that. So it must have two cones. If you send like only one, you get this huge machine-like thing. But if you send two of them, A and B at the same time, suddenly A also produces that output that inhibits one so that you actually, uh, the signal here is actually uh, diminished at A. So, so, the, so, so the, the signal from each of the receptors tend to decrease, but so does the ability to inhibit each other. Okay, so the net result is that the overall increase in illumination is actually largely ignored. Okay, and our brain is made more aware of this difference in illumination at A and B than it would be without lateral inhibition. So the result is very important. The result is that an edge where light intensity changes rapidly from lighter to darker is made more noticeable, and we call that edge enhancement, where an overall illumination change is not so apparent. This is the organizing principle of our brain. By the way, how many of you have been driving, say, for three hours on the highway, getting sleepy, and it was so routine, and then suddenly a deer crosses you, and then you slam the brake. How can you do happen? You were almost sleeping, and then something, and that's because there was some such change. You know, that's, that's the reason, you know. It, it, when you have something changed, our brain recognizes it because of lateral inhibition, okay? So change is the, the issue here. And we, the amplification of difference in activity of neighboring neuron is what this new uh, lateral inhibition gives you. Okay, and uh, we're going to come back and talk about horizontal amacrine cell in our eyeball later on. Here's the retina. I'm going to come back to and discuss it. You will see that that it has exactly this kind of organization. Okay, so so increased elimination of the region of the retina diminishes actually the signal to the brain from the neighboring neuron. This makes signal sent to the brain relative insensitive to overall illumination changes, but very responsive to differences in light striking the two regions. So this ability of one part of the retina to inhibit the signal from the other is, is called lateral inhibition. That's the result of the Nobel Prize. Here's a re re real story. My wife and I spent this winter in Helsinki some years ago, and it was dead winters, so very cold. Each of us, of course, uh, we have a common blanket, but we have two controls. We have our separate control. I was on the city, on the colder side where they really cold. By the way, she's not my wife, okay? This is just a, just an illustration. And the point is, I'm, I just grabbed the wrong uh, that, that control. My wife grabbed my control, I grabbed her. So I was too cold, so I would increase my, my heat. Okay, but that increased the, the, the heat of my wife, so she became feel hot. So she make it make, decrease the heat, make it colder, and that enhances the differences. And this just becomes a feedback loop, uh, you know. And so, in other words, a small difference between the room temperature on the two sides of our bed is actually enhanced. I get extra cold, and she gets extra hot. So that's lateral inhibition. So, neuroscientists, in fact, have come to realize that lateral inhibition is present in all visual systems and most other sensory systems as well. I'm going to show you some examples. This is called a Darth Vader. By the way, this new Star Wars movie is coming out. We're going to see Darth Vader again. Well, here's a Darth Vader. Uh, and you can see there are two compound eyes, left and right. If you, if you zoom in, you see they're exactly like the uh, like, like the limulus. And in fact, Darth Vader was scary, but this is not so, it's, it's quite benign. This is just a lady back. It's called Darth Vader because it has this helmet protecting her, just like Darth Vader, okay? And so, so, that, so that's uh, the lateral compound eyes, lateral inhibition of the Darth Vader. And so is the breeder star. Uh, and, and there's a paper published in Nature just a few years ago, and they, uh, the scientists uh, discovered that there's a species of starfish called breeder stars, which has CNN, a CNN light sensing micro lens array, whose local couplings consist of bundles of nerve cells. Uh, this is what a, 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 a picture of the micro lens array of the breeder stars, and. So, so th those are all based on lateral inhibition. Now I'm going to go to 
humans now. So, and, and, and toy discussion, I'm going to go in much more detail into the retina. But, but now I just want to go back to show you that, that uh, uh, we, unlike the, the com compound, we have a single uh, eyeball, but it, everything goes to the back of the eyeball in the retina. We're going to talk about that a little later. Okay. Now, imagine now looking at this uh, pattern on top. Those are uniform patterns of different grades, increasing from one intensity to, to darker and darker. And, but I think most of you would agree that uh, in, the, with, in, in the interface, it's a little bit lighter on the left and a little bit darker to the right, right? Look at it carefully. So the, so the, 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 the diagram shows that it's actually darker, okay? If you don't see that, your eye is defective, okay? Because that's how you should see this. But if you put a robot there and with a, meat, a light meter, you are going to see exactly what it is. There is no, so that's, that's an illusion, okay? And, and, and uh, that, this is a famous uh, Mach ban, and you can explain this immediately as a lateral inhibition, okay? And this is this example, and Mark Ban is the uh, one guy who did this. Okay, here's another example. What you see on the left is darker, and the, those on the right is, 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 is lighter. That's, uh, uh, but if you take out the background, you can see they are the same. So it's illusion. This is all because of lateral inhibition. Okay, now here's a template that will do the same thing. And I try to combine them so it's now a square. You can see the picture on the left is perceived on the right, where uh, the, the, the left or the, uh, the on, on the outer rectangle is a little bit more white in, in the, and a little more right to the left, to, on to the right of the edge. And the smaller rectangle, the same thing happened, a little bit whiter and a little bit darker, okay? So this is an example that a simple template like that would do the, the illusion, okay? And, and, and so, so once you realize it, uh, by the way, there were all kinds of books written about all kinds of illusion, but they were all by psychologists mostly, and they were all making arguments that seems reasonable, but nobody actually can, can, can prove anything. And I'm not saying that this is a template in our brain, but at least I can show you one example where this happens, okay? And it's not difficult to imagine that we will have neurons they, with the synapse, right? Synapses that will carry out similar things, okay? And, uh, now here's an interesting thing. I, don't, I hope you, you guys can see it. Can you stare toward that black dot? Don't, don't move your eye. And, 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 and look at the, and, and on the side view, you see at the intersection of the grid, do you see a little darker? I hope you do. If, if, if you don't see a little darker, your eye is defective as well, okay? You always see some darker thing. And, and that's lateral inhibition. The reason is very simple. You look at that. There are, there are four negative, Lateral in at the at the corner at, at the center, okay. That, that inhibit whereas the, if you are in the in between, there's only two, okay. So you can explain that immediately. It's all lateral inhibition. Same thing here. All of you, I think, should see the X thing, okay. That's not true, you know. If you're a machine, you will see not, not that. If you're a light meter, those X will disappear. That's because of lateral inhibition. So neuroscientists, if I have come to realize that lateral inhibition is present in all visual systems and in most other systems as well. In fact, uh, the, the, let's go to touch. And, and the best example is uh, the brain, if you are blind, you develop very good sensitivity and you just touch with two fingers and, and there are nine dots and, they, and, you can, and you, with two fingers, you, you, you can feel the dots and that's how the, the brain reads, okay? Now it turns out that uh, that was made easy because we have uh, of touches also, not just outside, has lateral inhibition. So without the lateral, in, lateral inhibition, the two dots next to each other would appear the one on the back. And, and with a little, just a little thing, valley separating that, and that's not very sensitive. But because of lateral inhibition, you actually perceive a much bigger uh, 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 difference, and that's, that's how it works. You know? And by the way, uh, all, the, all our sense system go, had many more cells. This is a, a, a true, if you would proportionate the size of the finger, uh, uh, the number of sensors you have for touch, this is what it should look like. And the, the lip particularly would be much bigger because there are many more sensors. In some, in some sense, the more touch sensor you have in your lips, the better the quality of your kisses. Okay, that, that's one way to think about this. Okay? Now, if you want to design a robot to hold it, a light bulb uh, and don't slip, or especially if you don't slip, you're gonna need lateral inhibition to, to do it. And, and, and pe few people realize the zero machines, 
you know, was able to get so sharp a picture. How is that possible? It's only one black carbon that comes down, but because the electric field uh, is designed such a way that you have a lateral inhibition, you have a sombrero uh, template, and it, it greatly sharpened the, the, the picture here. Okay? Now, by the way, all, there are many artists have long exploited without realizing it, okay? They exploit the lateral inhibition in the paintings. El Greco, that most of you, I'm sure, know, surrounds his white figures with black areas to make figures appear brighter and almost luminous. Here's an example. Here, here's El Greco, okay? And uh, one of my famous uh, favorite painters. Look at that, the, the great bright spot on the, in the cloud, and then, and then you know, the, the, the lady in the thing, see how bright his face, her face is? That, that was because of the clever use of, of, of black and red, I mean, black and white contrast. That's lateral inhibition exploited by the artist by El Greco without realizing it, okay? And here's another El Greco paint. See how bright those clouds are? It's, it's lateral inhibition. How many of you knew George Sherrod? Well, not many, but he's a famous painter, one of my favorite too. He paints by just putting a dutch, a lot of dutch. That's called pointillism, okay? And, and, and he's very clever as well. He, uh, he painted in such a way with a dot so that if he wanted to enhance a sharp edge, he would have just many more dots. And here's a one of his famous rod painting. If you look carefully, you see they're all points. If you go to a museum, you see they're all points, okay? And you can see how, how sharp the, the back is, okay, because of the black edge in that, and uh, many more black dots. And that's, that's perfect exploitation of lateral inhibition. Okay, that's the first part of my talk about lateral inhibition, that two more parts in three important things I'm gonna talk about today. That, that would be the end of my CNN lecture, by the way, but there are three things. The first thing is lateral inhibition, and you've seen enough of this. Our brain is, is made of many, many CNNs that use lateral inhibition, all our senses, because that's the one that when you sense something, you have to have lateral inhibition to help you sort of increase your sharpness, okay? So now the next question is another kind of bacteria in the brain that is also CNN. Here is a, a picture in Scientific American by uh, Mark, um, who visited me at Berkeley, when he gave a talk on this famous experiment that led to this, um, that, uh, that uh, described in this Scientific American uh, issue. Uh, uh, Mark is from Konishi, and he was a remarkable scientist. Uh, what he, uh, he's most famous for, uh, this experiment. He had barn owls. Now, she, this is a, a, a snap picture, you know, very high speed photography. The, it is the, 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 the owl the, is actually flying down to catch the mouse below. But this is in total darkness. You, you know, you have, you have need special technology to take this snapshot. The point, the point is that the owl has good, two eyes, but the eyes is useless because it's total darkness. And yet, the owl was able to catch the mouse every time. This is a true experiment, okay? So you can just zoom down, catch the mouse. So, so this is called hyperacuity. Because the barn owl can pinpoint the exact location of a moving sound source, such as the mouse, in total darkness, better than any other animals. Its neurons can respond to sound from the two ears in such a way as to provide the owl with a very detailed and precise map of the space in front of it. So even though the individual sensing neurons have a rather slow response time, we're talking about hundreds of milliseconds in our, our brain, okay? so as well as the owl. But a proper collection of such neurons, which means a CNN, is capable of extremely fast computation, which is in microseconds. And this, Emergent computation capability is called hyperacuity in time. So that's the name, hyperacuity in time. So the barn owl literally sees the world with its ears. Now this is called hyperacuity because the, the response time of our neuron is very slow. We talk about hundreds, 500 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds in the owls even slower. And yet to make this happen, to be able to detect, cut this mouth, you have to depend on the on, on the sound you, you hear, and, and you need microsecond kind of uh, capability to distinguish that. So how is that possible? Well, a CNN makes that possible. So here's an example. Um, um, the two, by the way, this is another discovery by, uh, by Mark, Mark Ganesi. 
It was amazing. He, was, he discovered that the two ears of the owl is not exactly at the same level. It's a little bit tilt. One is a little higher than the other. That, that, that actually contributes toward this, this, this amazing capability. So it must not a mouse. And if you are in the dead center, then of course, the same, uh, same distance. But just a little of that, you have a little longer distance to travel. And the sound would therefore take a little longer to reach. So there's now a difference in time. Okay? So, so uh, now imagine now a mouse is, is moving from left to right. And uh, the amazing thing is that if all you need is a CNN. And this has been done by uh, Professor Roska's laboratory in Budapest. It's a one dimensional CNN with the A and B template there, instead of only just at, uh, uh, the next neighbor, the next and next neighbor. Okay? And just with that CNN, was, they built actually a chip that was able to, to you need about a, a 10 millisecond you know, resolution to be able to do this right. And this is, uh, uh, this, they actually built a chip, by the way, and I'll show you how to respond. Uh, the numbers pertain to the number of the CNN from left to right. So as a mouse strip from left to right, uh, here it shows a capture that at, at, at the time the, the, the left edge number cell number eight is firing. And then almost immediately the next next one, uh, number nine and next note is firing, and then the next one, so it, you can see that that uh, how this works with a C and N. Okay. So that's hyper acuity in time. It's amazing, you know, that that uh, so that's, that's what the imp great thing about uh, this CNN principle uh, is, is that the individual neurons, uh, individual cells are, are pretty, pre pretty stupid, but put them together with the right local interaction, you can accomplish a marvel. This is a marvel, okay? Now, electric field is something similar, except now it's not in marvel in time, it's now in space. The, and by the way, the, here's a, a water, Heiligenberg. Uh, he actually presented a lecture in a seminar also that showed that, that essentially he discovered CNN, uh, that, the, that the electric phase is also a CNN. And I'm going to show you first the, uh, what, he, uh, what, a, what his electric phase is. So, so the electric phase, by the way, can detect the shape and position of nearby objects. For example, a predator okay, uh, or an obstacle. In total darkness, because this electric fish live in deep uh, ocean, and it's totally dark. Okay, and even though they have, they have eyes just like but now is the, the eye is not useful actually at all. Okay? But they can do that better than any other marine animals. This is why the electric fish is being chosen as an object of experiment. In this case, in the case of electric fish, objects in the vicinity of the fish body modulate the periodic electrical signal generated by the fish. And the difference in phases between neighboring neurons provide the cue for spatial distances. So even though the individual sensing neurons have very poor individual spatial resolutions, a proper collection of such neurons is capable of computing with much higher spatial resolution. At least three, we're talking about three orders of magnitude better. This is quite amazing, you know. And this emergent computation is called hyperacuity in space. Now let me backtrack to show you the details. Okay, so so uh, the de detail is uh, back to. Okay, here is the electric fish. Uh, it, it has a, a some kind of big high voltage battery in the tail that that creates an electric field in the current flowing around, and it's quite amazing. It's it's uh, when you have a non-conducting object, it will distort the current pattern, and thus uh, alters the uh, trans-epidermal voltage in the area of the skin nearest to the So the electric fish has these sensors all along a line. So it's a one-dimensional CNN, by the way, okay? And just by virtue of the distortion of the current path, there is a phase difference in, in, in the response, and, and the sensor picks it up and can accurately pinpoint where it is. So if it's a predator, the, the, the fish knows how to, how to run away, for example, okay? Now, uh, but the amazing thing is this, the sensor, you see, look at the, the, the top line. Imagine there are 10 cells uh, along a C line, and each cell is, is a sensor, and this, this sensor is to 
predict the distance of an object, how far? Is it five meters away, 10 meters away, or, or, or 10 centimeters away? And it turned out that if you look at individual, this is called tuning curve of individual sensor, it's actually very, very, very poor. It's primitive. You remember, your object is to detect uh, object, how far you are. X is the distance, zero is where you are, okay, yourself. Now, if you are, if the object is about one meter away, that's pretty good because you have a straight line. So you can say it, you have a big signal, the difference within one and within 0.5 and 2.5, you actually have a very good distance sensor. So you can sense it from, from, from a, a one meter to two meter pretty well. But if you get away from more than two point, uh, two, uh, two meter, the, the thing is flooded now, so you almost get no, no difference. So you can tell the difference, the distance. Well, I swear if you're very near, if you're say 10 centimeters away from the body, that's bad luck, you know, you see the top, it's almost flat. There's almost no, no resolution. It's a primitive sensor. So how can the electric fish manage to be so accurate? Well, the, the, the marvel is this. Uh, let, me, let me go back to the, the first, I'm sorry. Let me go back, back, okay. Imagine now you have a line, and this is discovered by Dr. Heiliger-Genberg, okay? Uh, he, uh, so we didn't originate it, but he realized after talking to us that it's a CNN. And what he did was actually a CNN. So you have a line of sensors. Each one is terrible. The, the, the tuning curve, the one that just shown at a position, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very bad, poor, bear-shaped curve. But Heiliger-Genberg had a line of the sensor, and he had a template coefficients that increases. So uh, say that you are the cell number one, it will be weighted by just one. If you're the next one, cell number two, you multiply by two. That's the template uh, coefficient. Cell number three, you multiply by three, four by four and five by five, just an illustration. So the formula now of the template is uh, the CNN is on the right, okay? It's, it's, it's just sum all these five sensors, but weighted. Now see what happened. This is a very poor primitive sensor, but you have three of them on top, for example. The second one is weighted twice. The third one is weighted three times. You add them all up, according to that for CNN formula, you get something a, little, a lot better. With only five sensors, with only five of them, you can see now it's even, in fact, this is from Haile Genberg. With only five, uh, but you, each one scale up by, by, by this uh, uh, integer, you get the wonderful sensor on the right side that is almost straight from minus four to four. This is highly end result. He did it because we are knowing what CNN is, but he realized that this is in fact a CNN. So what I'm telling you is that CNN is not just a technology uh, that, that, we would, uh, that we should exploit. It's facially now uh, the, the machine, the, the chip is now available, uh, but it is really how our brain works and how nature a lot of major work, you know. It's, it's all CNN principle. And we'll see that toward, almost toward end. When we talk about complexity, you see again the CNN. When we talk about reaction diffusion, you will see again CNN. So CNN is not just the brain. That's why I don't call it cellular neural network. I call it cellular nonlinear network, okay? And, and uh, so certainly these are not neural. They, these, these are not brains. Or this, this is just a CNN along the body of the electric fish, okay? So this is called hyperacuity in space, okay? So I've now covered these three important topics today just to demonstrate that CNN is, is not just technology for, for application, which of course is the main reason for Toshiba to come up with this, this sensor they're selling, but, but it is in fact much deeper than that because it's in all of us, it's in our brain, okay? And so now, you may not realize that some of our neurons are motion sensitive, okay? So for all example, I have, you know, well, in some sense, the last exam, two examples, you can say that motion sensitive are sort of because they involve motion, right? But here is a real example, you know, of a flock. Uh, most uh, ganglion, ganglion, well, you don't know, most of you don't know what a ganglion cell is. Uh, this is the, the, the last layer of our retina that I'm gonna show you in the discussion. Most ganglion, the frog also have retina much like the human, except that the retina is already attached to the front, to the eyeball, okay? So most, most ganglion cells in the frog retinas respond only to a small dark object moving irregularly because the fly 
you know, it's the food for, for the frog, and it flies irregularly. So when a frog is presented with such a stimulus, the frog, uh, hoping a bug is near by, is flying by, will snap his tongue out and attempt to capture the object. That's his dinner. Okay, that's, nature evolved in such a way that, that the frog is specialized in catching, and so he responds to motion, in other words, okay? And because of that, uh, f frogs capture and eat only moving prey. So bugs that have recently, in fact, died would have made a perfectly delicious meal for the frog, but the frog great enough is so wild that the frogs do not respond to stationary object. So a frog, this is real experiment, the frog would actually starve to death amidst a field of dead bugs, you know, because you know, the, the rates in that just can, has to respond to something that moves, okay? And so, so this is an example I said, unlike engineering design. Someone asked a question about evolution uh, two lectures ago, and I said evolution does not optimize. Uh, if you were an engineer, if nature were an engineer, he would have surely included a freshly dead box for dinner, but he did not, okay? So our brain is, in fact, sloppy and imprecise. But that's just actually our, the strength, our strength, because we strive to be orderly, whereas evolution does not. Engineers, you know, evolution does not strive for that. It, the evolution just adds on. Tinkers, it's a tinkerer. It reuses parts, all parts that works. Evolution favors anything that works, no matter how wacky. It just has to work, okay? It chooses easy over the best. He's not an engineer. Quick over precise. This does not, of course, result in perfect design, unlike engineering. But it is good enough. When it comes to creative solutions, messy offer far more scope than tidy. That's what evolution is all about. Okay? Now, here's an example of CNN that will respond to motion. We're talking about the frog can respond more. How, how is that possible? How, you know, where, how, how can a frog? Well, it turns out that a CNN simply can demonstrate that. Here's the CNN template. It's a little bit bad slide here, unfortunately, but that's the best I had. It was about 30 years ago. Uh, now, with that template, A template and the left, B template, and then the, the threshold with us, 19 numbers. Remember, it's just 19 numbers. It's truly amazing. Most people who didn't understand theory would say this is magic, okay? Now, the purpose of this is to sense the speed of moving object. And we designed those template in this case. On the, look at the left, left, row, left column here. You have a school bus that travels, say, 30 miles an hour. Then you have a, a Volkswagen maybe walking at 60 miles twice. And then you have a Ferrari looking, walking at, say, 120 miles per hour. We have designed CN so that you would pick out only objects that move at the normal rate of 60 miles per hour, the middle one. So uh, at T0, you can see the top and the bottom is the, is the output of the CNN. So they, the CNN begins to detect the, the work as you at T0. And then you can see that, that the front, is, 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 the, 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 the car is moving. The, the Ferrari is, is taking over now at, in the third one. The, for, the Volkswagen was in between. Now the CNN, the second partner, you can see that it begins to pick up, uh, to, to lose the, the, the details of the slow one or the fast car. By the third shot, you can see that it would pick up only this Volkswagen. And so that's an example of a simple CNN template, 19 numbers that can detect motion. And you can change those number to change the speed as you want, okay? And in fact, I'm going to ask for video, the next video that will, uh, and the next, in the next uh, uh, five videos, three videos, will show you more application of CNN. The next, the first one is on, uh, on this motion, except now, instead of just a car, we have a 747 in a missile, okay? Uh, just to make it more dramatic. So can I have the video five, please? The output of the CNN is shown at the bottom of the screen. That's a As we can button. see, only the missile appears in the output. See, the, the, the signal shows no longer shows the 747. I'm gonna, okay. can, can we run that one more time? Look, you know, the, 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 the output the, of the CNN is shown at the bottom of the 747 screen. 747 too slow. So, As we can see, so only, only the, the missile, missile appears in the output. Is, is, is pick up. That's just a CNN. Okay. The next video is. Uh, Video six, please. 
Now imagine they have decoys in these warheads, you know, you have the ICBM. Now the, the, the top are those different warheads. What you bought them, is just, I just show you two of them. You can see it's trucking. Truck, can I have that one more time? The, the bottom is, just, I just show you two panels. That's trucking the, 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 the object in front. Okay, the bottom one. See that? The, okay. So, so, so you can have a CNN that can track, you know, multiple objects in flight at very high speed. And the last video uh, is an application of CNN for navigation. The robot has no explicit knowledge of the locations of the objects in the environment. Instead, it deduces the position of the objects by use of a camera mounted in front of it. The information acquired by the camera is processed by several CNNs, which are sensitive to objects with different times to contact with the robot. OK, so, so of course, we, we don't know what, what Google's uh, car is doing to avoid things. But uh, here's one way to do it, OK? And, and it, it just involves a simple CNN. So, so it's not such a, a difficult thing to avoid ob obstacle. OK, so uh, now let me move on. Uh, so the, the, the frog's retina maps the image of the outside. It, 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 so the frog not, not only uh, is a motion sensor, but it's interesting because we now know, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Sperry that you're going to meet in a few minutes from now, we, he has shown that the frog's retina maps the image of the outside world into a topographically equivalent internal image in its tectum. We also have a tectum, by the way, up here. So is the frog. Okay? It's located, in the, for the frog, it's located at the roof of the brain. So like uh, drawings on a rubber sheet, a topological map preserves the relative position of the neighboring pixel. So, so imagine you're drawing something and, 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 and on a rubber sheet, and you can, you, can, you, can, you can stretch it in different direction. You distort it, but, but you can recognize it because the pieces that are nearby are nearby, OK? And this is basically what the frog um, brain is. And so is our brain, our human brain. We, uh, this were not all parts, but, but the part that needs this kind of information and toward the back of our brain are topographic. And, and Hubert and Wiesel, you that you met last week, already found that out, but, but this is more definitive. Uh, the, the, uh, so, so here's an example of the frog. The, the eyeball, uh, for example, has these sensors that are labeled there with the, with the uh, neighboring relationships, say. So alpha and beta, they're all next to each other and, and chi. Uh, and then the, the, when, when it's the no optic nerve reaches the tectum, which is the, on, on the roof top of the head, you get a, a different uh, uh, image, but you can see that it's, it's, it's just like you stretch the rubber sheet, but the, the nearby points is nearby, and that's what topographic means. And much of our uh, uh, striate cor uh, cortex, by the way, uh, is in fact topographic. Okay. Now we come to Roger Sperry, our, our uh, next Nobel Prize winner. And in, in, uh, so you have met Hartline, now we have second one uh, that discovered this thing. And he's an amazing person here because he not only discovered what I'm going to show you next, but I, I told you uh, last week that our, uh, our brain has two hemispheres, the left half and the right half. Uh, the, the, the left half are basically logic, language, you know, digital. Right half is, is uh, uh, analog, ho holistic, like they see a whole Chinese character. And most people actually before him, thought that the right half is, is, not, is inferior because it's not so interesting. It doesn't, it doesn't compute or do anything, you know? And it, it turned out, because in view of Dr. Sperry, he actually performed real experiment first on monkeys and then on, on humans, but of course he doesn't get a human and cut, off his, cut open his head. He waited for peop, people that had epilepsy, that had no uh, severe form of epilepsy that the only way to cure is to cut open the brain and she cut up something, okay? So he, would, he was working with those kind of patients. He knew what he was looking for. And he was, through very careful, ingenious experiment, he was able to show, unlike the, well, the Japanese brain syndrome, which just said it makes sense. If you get a, a traffic accident and it hurt your left side, you can't read the other side. I mean, the Chinese paint right dig anymore. That's, that's, that's just an just a, a anecdota. He, Dr. Perry actually proved it that's how he got the Nobel Prize, okay, for this thing, 
very ingenious experiment. And he was not only showing that this left-right asymmetry is true, but he was able to show that unlike most common feeling, that the right side is sort of not so interesting, inferior, is actually much more superior in the sense that it's much, all the higher brain function. If you are, if, if you are intellectual, you want to think deeper, it's all in the right brain, okay? So, so if you had to have an accident and you have a choice, it, you want to have your left brain damaged and not only right, okay? Because all your intellectual part comes from the right. And that's because of Roger that we knew that. That's why he got an overpriced. Okay, now Roger did this wonderful experiment, a simpler one. So he had a good sense of uh, cutting out the, 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 the uh, eyeball from the optic nerve of the eyeball of the frog and then rotate it by 180 degrees. Just imagine this eyeball. I'm going to take it out, okay? In fact, uh, okay, we have the eyeball here and he just take it out for the frog. And, and, he, and I'm going to, I don't want to reach up, I'm going to show that later. And he just wrote a hundred, so the eye, the, 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 it's the same eyeball like, like, our, uh, like the humans. And he wrote a hundred degree and then, and they let the frog, you know, the reco recover up, you know, for maybe a few days. What happened is that because of this uh, chemical cues that nobody really understood, somehow the optic nerve that gets cut up knows how to go back and get reconnect to the same optic nerve that has been severe. So you, you can grow back, except that the thing has been rotated. And this was all planned by, by Sperry. He, he, he expected some, when this happened, something interesting would happen. And so this is what happened. Okay, well, this is the experiment that he did. So when the frog now flies by, the frog would spit his tongue in the opposite direction because his eyeball now has been rotated. This is just a perfect proof of his theory. Okay, so, the, the, so well, this is the easy part uh, of the experiment. But, but what he got in Nobel Prize is not just, it's basically showing that the right brain is what he's doing and what's superior, okay, and much superior, higher than, 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 than the left brain. Okay. And uh, so, so actually, I'm uh, a little bit uh, uh, f f uh, faster than I had thought. So uh, for next week, um, we're going to have, uh, we're done with CNN, by the way, uh, as far as our brain as concerned, but it, uh, toward the end, we're going to have more CNN. It's just, uh, it will be a Turing machine, those kind of thing. Again, they work by CNN principle. You have a lot of identical uh, cells that just communicate with the neighbors. Each cell is almost uh, useless, stupid, and yet together it, it, it creates mar marvels. So, so this is the unifying principle throughout this this lecture, I mean, okay. And, and now, uh, for those of you interested uh, in uh, these next few lectures, uh, and, and, and uh, if you are interested in some many of these picture, pictures, this is my book that was written many years ago. But but the pictures are are, are, are much better than what you have seen here, and it would run into local activity toward almost toward the end. So you will. You will, uh, you, 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 you can look forward into the future as well. So the next lecture is called uh, Sights and Sounds of Chaos. So we, we, we're done with CNN, okay? And, and, and you will see that that's where local activity comes back again. So local activity is all along, you know, in the background. Uh, none of the CNN, all these miracles would, would have worked without the cells being locally active, for example, okay? And, but, those of you who may not know enough about CNN, uh, of, or everything you want to know about CNN, uh, it's going to be next lecture. And there's going to be enough sights and sounds, including a, a laser demonstration that, uh, that, that uh, Dr. Professor Kennedy, who was the past vice president of the University of Cork in Ireland, has built 30 years ago in my lab. And as a good engineer should be, it still works today. So I'm going to bring that you know, machine here, and it's going to be laser, and you're going to have sound, and you're going to have music. So uh, any of you who had kids, uh, this would be a wonderful occasion to see the real sight and sound show. You know, and and, and uh, so that would be the next week. OK, so the end code is obviously Roger Sperry, and he rightfully said this, think of this, read this sentence carefully. The great pressure and feeling is my right brain is more than my left brain can find the words to tell you. Okay, I hope you understood. What he's saying is that the right brain is much more superior, okay, 
and that that's the thing. Okay, uh, I'm actually right on the dot uh, uh, for today, and I'm going to uh, stop and and entertain questions. And after the questions, I'm going to come back for round two, where you will see a lot more interesting things. Hopefully, uh, okay. So uh, thank you for listening. Any questions? No question. Not, nobody wants to know more about lateral inhibition, right? But you know enough. I, I hope I did a great job. So, so you all know what lateral inhibition is. You know, that's, that's, that's the organizing principle of your brain, my brain. A vast majority of, 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 of that is. Okay. And uh, okay, uh, n now let me move on to round two. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to show you a video which I, I skipped because I thought I would need more time. This was a video that uh, so far all of these examples are so sort of non-technical. I mean, not, not technology. It's, it's all about our brain. Okay, the fish, the electric fish, or the owl. It's all about how our brain works, which I hope are, are interesting enough for you. But I, I want to show you some real engineering. And this is uh, 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 a, a, an example of, uh, that Professor Tesla, Ronald Tesla from the University of Dresden, had uh, discuss, has, um, um, developed with a company in, in uh, Germany, as you know, the, 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 the high tech version of doing well, if you're well two uh, metals together, we used to have this very crude, you know, high energy, I mean, uh, 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 sort of torch. And, and they're they not very accurate, and they, uh, you waste a lot of heat, and, and things are very sloppy. So the high tech technology that are using high power laser, because the laser can concentrate the beam only in the area where you want to do well. And so you have a clean, precise welding. At the same time, there are no defect. If you, if you look at the old, the reason you have all this, some of these uh, airplane accidents that people later, this, this engine discovered after analysis that they were internal cracks that you didn't know, you know. So if you use laser welding, it's uniform. So, the, the, so they have, but the, their problem with this laser beam, because they saw to do that accurately, you have to have a high precision command and control and feedback. And Professor Tesla group developed such a technology using a CNN. In fact, they were using a, a CNN that's, ex, ex, that, that's actually a box like this, uh, because it was the Toshiba uh, sensor chip was not available until early this year, okay? But, but, but that Toshiba chip is actually a, a fancier version, a, a sort of with the bears and whistles added, but it's actually the same design. They had paid a company that made this just for that design, and they just add the wheel, bears and whistles in it. So I'm going to show you now uh, the picture of this uh, real laser beam welding. And watch for, first you got two little plates, metal plates, which is zinc, uh, zinc coated steel, and they uh, put them together just to weld to show that, uh, as I demonstrate, they're going to weld along a line. And at first you can see that uh, if they don't use that, it's pretty crude, but with the laser, it's actually very smooth. And of course, when you do welding, who cares that it should be smooth, you know? But the point is that the, the fact that it's smooth means that, that you have a uniform uh, welding. So if you look under, in, underneath uh, with a microscope, you can see that there are no, no defects in there. Okay. So, uh, and this was the project that had been recognized two years ago that Professor Tesla's group was uh, awarded with that uh, certificate that I've shown you earlier. Okay. okay, can I have the video number four, please? So these are the two plates that are going to weld together, okay? So after putting it together, they <clears throat> so the machine is inside the room. Okay, this is just a demo of the, uh, this is about 6,000 kilowatts, I mean, uh, six kilowatt beam. 
You can see it, 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 it just melt, the, the, the metal right there, and very precise. But to do this well and accurately, but all these uh, car companies you now, like, like a BMW and Mercedes Benz, they're all using laser welding because that's, that's what will give you good design. And I'm sure all those uh, aircraft company, you know, you are, they're going to have used uh, laser welding as well to be sure that you have a clean, welded uh, surface. Now, you just saw that up, up to, uh, that box up here. That's, that's the old version of the Toshiba sensor, okay? So that's, that's the two pieces of uh, zinc-coated steel plates that they're going to weld. This is the picture to cut short. These are the technical details. You see the technical uh, uh, result of that, which I won't have time to explain. But you can see now that that's the weld. You can see how, how smooth it is. Okay. You would never be able to get that kind of quality with with a conventional welding machine. Okay. And uh, the heart of this is a CNN. Uh, um, uh, you can see that, that little square blue box there. That was the, that was the, that's basically the Toshiba smart sensor chair. The one on top, the blue part, okay? That's, that, that is a box about this size. Now, see that this, this, the result of the welding is so clean, clean and smooth. Okay, uh, let me now uh, move on to, uh, pa, pa, pa. Can, can I have now uh, the first part of uh, my discussion? And I, I believe it's now 1.59. Okay, so uh, we're going to, as I said, for most people who didn't know, this, what a CNN is, it looks, looks like abacraba, right? It's just, just like magic, okay? Now we want to go to the zonus of Jin, okay? How many of you know or heard of zonus of Jin? You know, I mean, it, it, it sounds, sounds like a, a rock, rock music band, but it's not a rock music band, okay? In fact, it may even sound like it, uh, from an ancient map from Indiana Jones, but it is not. It, it, it's a scientific term. Zonology, in fact, is just a, it's, it's a technical term. It's a fancy term. It's just tiny tendrils, which in fact, the most delicate part of all the, of our brain. The most remote outpost, the gateway to our mind. So if you imagine all of our, you know, how we get information from outside world, this is the most remote outpost. And now I'm going to tell this out. Okay, so, because we have the cornea and we have the lens. Here's the lens and here's our eyeball. Uh, we're going to look into it a little later. So how do you attach this lens to, to the eyeball? You need very fibers and, and you know, things like those fibers are the zonors of gene. That's what, those are the fancy name, but that's what it is. Okay, so that's the, the, the zonor of fiber. That's what connect attach the length to the thing. And, and uh, uh, so the zone of gene is just a ring of fibrous strands connecting the ciliary body, the muscles, you know, with a crystalline lens to, of, of the eyes. You know, because, uh, because our eyeball lens, uh, uh, ch lenses change their shape to focus image onto the retina. For example, to focus a distant object, the lens would be flattened a bit and from the normal shape. And uh, uh, normal is, is almost spherical, for example. Again, so you need you need to have this uh, control mechanism, and and uh, and, uh, and, you, and and you need to be able to attach, attach to the the lens to the to to, to the retina, and that's those are the zone of gene. Okay, so that's that's not the main part for this. But that was just an interesting name. So so I said ten things you didn't know. This is one of the ten things. Okay. Ah. Now, the human retina can be thought of, in fact, uh, as a mini brain. Uh, that's one of the 10 things I'm telling you that you didn't know, or at least most of you didn't know. Uh, because it develops in the fetus as an outgrowth of embryon, embryonic brain tissue. So, so you know, in, by evolution, if you go trace back, you can actually prove that 
that once it was attached to the retina of our, our eyes, okay? And we all know, that, of course, that, that, that the image, whatever you see, gets uh, inverted when you go to the back of the, of the retina, and that you have these uh, pupils and irises that, that, that uh, control the amount of light, like a camera, the aperture, and you all know that. But what I want to show you next is more interesting, is that if you look through the back of this uh, retina, you will see that there's a hole in the back. And, and that hole is essential because also where the optical cables came out, okay? Is that there's a hole, and I'm going to come back later. And, and because there were no, no uh, sensors there, uh, that's, that's called a blind spot, okay? And, and uh, it's interesting, you know, we, we actually have a blind spot. The question is how come, if, we have a, if you have a blind spot, have a blind spot, how come every picture we see, we should see a hole somewhere we didn't, right? And nobody actually knows why, but some, our brain knows how to, how to sort of patch them up. And, and something like the scratches, the feeling of the scratches, for example, is an algorithm that, that could easily do that, okay? But if you really want to prove that you have a blind spot, it's, it's that difficult. I just don't have the time to tell you. You can, you can focus your eyes into a certain, say, a cross, and then look sideways. You can actually see your blind spot. It's actually, so, so it's there, okay? And now, interesting thing is that not, people didn't know that until about the, the last century. And uh, so, so the, there's a blind spot there, okay? But not very nearby the blind spot is that little tiny dent. It's called a fovea, which is the Latin for depression. It was just about a, you know, about a, a, a half a millimeter small pit in the diameter. But it turns out that, that is the part that where the most sensitive uh, resolution, more high resolution sensing comes from. I'm going to come back to that later on. Uh, there are two kinds of sensors in our retina, as you see shortly. One is called ROTS. They are, they are sloppy, but very fast. You know, very, very sensitive. To, sensitive to even one photon, but very sloppy, that accurate. Whereas there is a cone that is, I showed you earlier. Those are very, not only very accurate, but they are color sensors, okay? And in the fovea, that little dent there, there are no rods at all. It's all cones. So, so this is where you have your color vision and you're very high accurate. When you read something carefully, they all come from the image. It come from the fovea, okay? And uh, so, so now, interestingly, you know, upon learning of the blind spot, it was not known, uh, you know, until uh, in the uh, late 19th century. The English King Charles II, how many of you know Charles II? Uh, well, didn't know much about English history, I guess. But you know about a king that get uh, beheaded, don't you? That's, that's his father, okay? And, and, uh, but, and Charles II is also the king that presided with the great, great fire. How many of you, you heard of the great fire of London? Where, None of you seem to know much about English history, but anyway, he's a very famous character. Okay? Uh, Charles King, when he first learned about this uh, blind spot, he said to have amused himself by looking to the side and making the heads of his courtiers disappear. He, now, he actually did what I would say that you can do it. Okay? Uh, you can find your blind spot if you want to. Okay? okay, now let's go to something serious here. Here is the anatomy of your eyeball in my eyeball. If you look into this, Toward the back, those are the retina. So our front end is actually, you know, it's, it's nothing. It's just a lens system. But the, all the front important signals go to the back. And at the very end, by the way, are those uh, ruts, you know, those, uh, those blue thing and the green thing. The green thing are the cones. Those are called cones for good reason. It looks like a cone. And the other are called ruts for good reason. There are many, many more ruts, by the way, than cones. The, the, the ruts are very, very sensitive. Too sensitive to even one photon. One photon light is going to re, uh, send a signal, okay? Uh, whereas the cone is very, very, uh, uh, needs a lot of light, okay? But they are very accurate. So we have two systems of sensors. And the sens sens these are individual and, uh, cells now, think of them. You know, the, so there's a, 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 the, the contact with the next layer are called a, uh, bipolar, bipolar cells. And you can see that they are, they, these are the synapses, okay? So that's the front end. And that first layer is, is chemical, it's not electrical. So it spit out signal to the second level, bipolar, it's called a, I'm sorry, called a horizontal. It is horizontal, horizontal cells. And notice that between the first two layers, and I'm talking about the far end, by the way, so we're talking, it's very, our eye is very interesting. 
you know, the, our light comes in the front end. It, it doesn't start from there. It actually goes all the way to the back first. And they come back again, and they go out through the optic nerve. You make a zigzag. Nobody knows why, but that's, how, that's our anatomy, okay? So, so, so we're look, looking at the front end, the sensors, and then the, the, the interface between the sensor and the next layer are called the horizontal cells. There are things that goes around there. I mean, by, the, those things, that the, 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 the round thing come, those are bipolar, as I said earlier. But in between, you see these this arms going out, those are called horizontal cells. Those are the lateral inhibitions, okay? So, so that's important. So, so we already have lateral inhibition at the second layer. And it interfaces the, the, the sensing rods, sensors with the bipolar. But the bipolar comes down to the next layer called amacrine uh, cells. And those amacrine cells is the next layer that connects to the final layer that's called the ganglion cell. Ganglion cell is, is the cell that spits out the action potential because those are the cells that, that, that spit out the action potential. They're all electrical now, and they go through this, this that thing on the bottom. Those are all cables. That, these are all recently wires that goes out into the blind spot. But notice that the amacrine cell is again horizontal, spreads out. You know those yellow things? Those are the amacrine cells. Those are the lateral inhibition again. So you can see this, this lateral inhibition is all over, okay? And you need that, you know, that you need, you need CN templates that have both positive and negative numbers, by the way, okay? So now here's a good picture. A rod looks like that. And this is the real picture now, a, a greatly magnified picture, and the cone looks like right. And you can see the synaptic ending. That, that, you know, those, 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 there's a gap, of course, that you all know. You know, and then uh, this is a, a, an even bigger uh, enlargement of the of the cones and the rods. Uh, the, the, the red picture now. Okay, so uh, so the horizontal cells and the amacrine cells in the retina provide the coupling between neighbor cells. They are retinas B template. Okay, and uh, uh, I'm going a bit out of time. So here is the, where the cables come out where the blind spot is greatly magnified. And so here the center is the fovea, and the yellow spot there is, is the blind spot, okay? Where the, you see a lot of blood vessels, that's the blind spot, okay? So, so we're talking about the far end now, here through the hole, very nearby, you can see the far with all those blood vessels, that's the blind spot. But nearby there is the fovea, okay? okay. Now, uh, now here's more things you didn't know, okay? So there are approximately 800,000 optic nerve fibers. There are approximately 15 rod receptors per optic nerve fiber. Uh, on average, one cone receptor in the fovea per optic nerve. And that in whole, where the optic nerve lips the blind has no rods or cones. And that's why it's called a blind spot. You, I already mentioned that. And I'm going uh, a bit out of time, so I'm going to keep going. So the first step in the cortical processing of visual information takes place in the back, in you know, the, the straight cortex. All these cables now go to the back through an intermediate part called the LGN that I don't have time to talk about today. Uh, this part is the occipital, you know, the, 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 eye, you know, the vision part of the brain, which is toward the back, like you have seen already. So the visual input of a straight cortex is like the LGN, is commonly crossed. The left visual field projects to the right of the, of the straight cortex and the right to the left. The mapping from retina to straight cortex is topolo topographical, something that I told you already that Sperry discovered okay, and proved. In that nearby on the retina project, project to the nearby near through the straight cortex, the transformation preserves qualitative spatial relation but distorts qualitative ones. Just much like an image on a rubber sheet can be distorted when it is stretched without being torn. Okay? So, I, I, I'm going to a bit forward now. This is what see the whatever you see in the in the left image from in you know of this girl's hand is projected in the head. It's projected back to the straight cortex you know, with a with a greatly distorted face. But but you can see the lips is still a lips. The eye is still eye. This is what make topographic means. Okay, and uh, okay. So that's the ten, ten things. And now I'm going to tell you ten more things. Okay, that 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 you didn't know. Okay, I have. Uh, about eight minutes, I'm going to... Uh, first of all, interestingly, uh, and not, 
not all optic nerves are topographic. I, I don't know, you know that. I, I didn't know that many years, uh, some years ago either, okay? So the optic nerves mapping onto the, the what's called the SCN, that's the, just the name of, of, of a long cent and line, I'm gonna pronounce it a little later. Um, a neuron is not topographic because it is the only, because the only task performed by this neuron is to sense the presence and absence of light of the sun. So those neurons that are coming from the optic nerve, his only purpose is to find uh, what, what, what time, that's why we have this circadian clock. That's why, you know, we have this time, time, uh, that time lock when you travel over from Europe to here, you know, you have to adjust your time and, and, uh, and that's be all because we have a clock in our brain. And that's where our, the red spot, that's called the SCN, okay? The SCN, that's in the, the relative position, that's with a part of the optic nerve. So our clock is actually located at what, now SCN stands for suprachiasmatic nuclei, and something I can never remember, my SEM. So, so it's not true that all our, all, all our uh, cables um, and uh, neurons are, are topographic. Uh, this is not, because why? Evolution, this, you know, realize that you don't need things to be nearby. All you need to do whether it's light or not, okay? So why, why, why bother? Anything that you don't need, in the nature would, would just uh, drop it, okay? Okay, so it, in fact, took 70 years to, to locate the, the, the mammalian master clock. It's so non-trivial. It's not something that people knew. It's only recently, in fact, that people found out where that is. The master clock in our brain consists of a cluster of about 20,000 neurons in the anterior part of the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nuclei, okay? Now, uh, I'm gonna uh, move on. Oh, by the way, this is, to prove to you, these are the cables. You can, indeed, it looks like a cable. If, I, if you cut a cross-section of it, it's exactly like an optical cable. In fact, it, it had all this ref, reflection index, all thing, just like if, an optical fiber, otherwise you wouldn't be able to conduct all these uh, signals, okay? So, so ganglion cells, in fact, are living optical fibers, okay? And uh, now I told you, human brain can detect light so weak, it has an energy of only one photon, and namely the rods. Now, th things that you didn't know more, more, 10 more things I said about uh, the cones is that the cones contain uh, pigments which make color vision possible. There are six million cones in the fovea where it has no rods, etc. About 50,000 cones are needed for fine vision. So a 256 by 250 CNN has 64,000 photo sensors. It can therefore be used to design, so you can actually design now at the artificial eye, we have the technology. All you need is about 256 by 250 CNN. Rods, by the way, are 500 times more sensitive to light than cones. Rods can detect light, that's like one photon. There are 120 million rods in human, distributed all over except in the blind spot, in the pho phobia, okay? Since there are only about one million optic nerves, well, there are 120 million rods. Many rods must share a single optic nerve, resulting in rather poor resolution. That's why the rods have very poor resolution. Cones are the one with high resolution. And if you go through the meter of the phobia, you see that there's no the green thing are they, in the middle, are they all, all cones, there are no rods. And then because these are the, there are three types of colors, there are red, green, and blue sensors. And uh, these are, the red cones have, well, let me just move. So there are roughly 30 times as many red and green cones. That's interesting. The red and green cones are more than the blue. I mean, people didn't know that until recently. So one out of 10 cones are of blue type. And, and the red and green are approximately the same. So more than 30, 90% of the optic nerves leaving the eye carry all the color information. Many more, and very few blue ones. So therefore, by mimicking a system, we can achieve at least 50% power saving by redesigning the display to provide no more information than the eye can absorb. So, so the, 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 the panel that you see now, they, you know, are designed in such a way that, that you don't have as many blue sensors because the eye don't need it, okay? Okay, uh, now, frog's retina, 90% of the frog's visual system is in the retina. I, I didn't know that until recently. Uh, dogs, cats, and many other familiar animals cannot discriminate between red and green. The goldfish, however, have four color receptors compared to only three in humans, okay? And to home in on the prey, to, uh, uh, the, the, the birds you actually use ultraviolet vision for many things. Uh, such as to detect camouflage, caterpillar during foraging, to dis in fact, to judge 
really attractiveness of different males. It turned out that, that, that the birds are sex, and the males are more sexy if you have, have more ultraviolet cones. And the eagle, for example, can spot a rabbit uh, three miles uh, because uh, the rats and cones are packed five times uh, the, more than humans. Okay, can I now have the last part, which is number uh, one, 146? This is the last part, which is, uh, uh, it turned out that our retina uh, evolution such is such that our retina, uh, our neuron, you have to use it. If you don't use it, it will, it, it will it'll die. A new brain cells will die unless they have a job to do. In other words, you have a good example. Here are two canary bells. The, the, the male canary bell in the left is trying to court the, the female. And, and, uh, but to do that, the canary bell has to compose a song. So a canary bell composes a different song every year. This is an example of par excellence of creative learning. Every male canary, canary bird who want to court a, a female, how to actually present a song, you know, to, to, to serenade her, okay? And, but so canary birds, of course, they lost their all song neurons every spring because uh, the, the, the female is not going to be happy to hear the same song. So after the spring, when it's over, it, it's gone. They, and and what, now, now what I mean by what the, the neuron will die. So, the, so actually, uh, the song region in the brain of the male canary grows to double its normal size in the spring to, to compose the song. But as the bird learns its song to attract a female. After the mating season, the song area shrinks and the song is forgotten. Next spring, the song area grows again as the canary learns a new song. And that's, that's, that's interesting. You know, you see actually literally the thing. The thing. And uh, so imagine the, the, what life would be like for us, you and me, if our brains were like those of the male canaries, which means that each year we would have to forget everything that we had learned and have to restart all over again. Thank God we're not canaries, okay? Uh, now, interesting, the canary male on the left, you can see that this blue thing, object on top, those are, those are ultraviolet. And a sexy male is one with a strong emitter of ultraviolet light in the forehead. That's how females, you know, get, you know, if, if you're lucky, if, if you're more handsome, in other words, if you have more of this uh, uh, ultraviolet violet sen sensors. Okay, now uh, I actually one minute left, and I, so I'd like to sort of go back to uh, 50, 153. Can I have 153, please? To conclude, let me go back to, to go back to one of the pioneers of vision study, David Marl from MIT. He, he, he said the vision is a process that produces from images of the external world a description that is useful to the viewer and not cluttered with irrelevant information. So therefore, why HS? Because by responding to variations such as HS, a pattern can be processed more efficiently than if it will each point were recorded. So for example, the red pattern in the left carries no more information than the edges. So why, why send, try, send the information of the interior point? So by responding to variations such as edges, that's why we have the larger inhibition. That's why nature evolves that. You know, a pattern can be processed more efficiently than if the point, each point were recorded. Our visual systems concentrate on edges to achieve efficiency in the storage and transmission of information. And more than half, more than half of your brain's cortex is devoted to vision. And more than 50% of the human intelligence is devoted to pattern recognition. That's the end of my talk, back to the magic again. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>